Wonderful. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Roger Shaw II. He has a couple BSs and a couple MSs in education, education, and aeronautical science. And he has some BS to boot. He's currently the team leader of Airman Education Programs for the Aeromedical Education Division of the FAA Civil Aeromedical Institute in Oklahoma City. The Airman Education Programs area supports the National Aviation Safety Prevention Programs and teaches aviation physiology, human factors, survival courses, and others. Mr. Shaw earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Oklahoma, his master's in education from Portland State University, and his master's in aeronautical science from Embry-Riddle. He's a retired U.S. Air Force pilot with over 3,000 hours in the C-7 Caribou, the B-52, and rescue hel helicopters. And I'm lucky enough, this is the second year I've gotten to uh, introduce Mr. Shaw. And as part of our appreciation for everything he's done for us here at Air Venture, as well as being a part of CAMI, we'd like to present him with this certificate of appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. How's this going on? There you go. Is that loud? Can you hear me? All right. Well, let's clear it up right at the beginning. There's no questions, and there's none at the end either. <laughs> that was a joke. You can ask questions. Listen, I'm going to talk to you about physiology. I'm going to give you in about 30, 45 minutes what we do in about six hours down at Cami. Everything I'm talking about is on this DVD. 18 subjects of physiology, eight survivals of sub, uh, survival. It's got handouts to them, and it's got a review section for each one. So I'm going to slide through some stuff pretty quick. So if you want this, it's out there. We're by the portable auction tent. We're out there in the first to the left as you come in. And if there's any questions, uh, please, you can ask them here at any time because I'm going to go pretty quick. So things have started to change since 1944. I don't know if we got noise, but it will work fine if you don't have noise. <laughs> lucky strike. I, listen, there's been a lot changed since that time, as there have been, but let me tell you about this. Aviation physiology has not changed a bit, okay? Every one of you are physiologically different, so when I talk about this subject, it's sort of a bell curve, and you've got to sort of decide where you're at on that. But I'm going to give you some basics of it, and we're going to go pretty quick. Physics in the atmosphere, gas goes around the Earth, okay? That quick pressure, how do we get that? gravity and stuff like that we don't really I'm going to try to get to the points I want to stress so you understand what's happening to your body when we go to altitude when it concerns to hypoxia trapped gas and DCS okay so how do we measure it uh, 760 millimeters of mercury we like to use it in the physiology business in the airplane you use this 29.92 inches of mercury by the way uh, I have been married 49 years, seven kids, 28 cars, 13 dogs, and a whole bunch of puppies. So this is not a human factor marriage counseling briefing. But that I have survived it, there are some factors involved in the physiology that will help you. And I have some jokes. This is recorded? It's all recorded? Jeez, that changes the whole scenario. I'm retired in December after 40, 24 in the Air Force, and, 25 and a half here, I'm retiring, so I guess I could tell you some good jokes, because I'm going out in December, and when does this go online? Pretty fast? Yeah. The chicken crosses the road, gets in a mud puddle, comes back, what is he? A dirty double crosser. Well, this is free. I mean, you know, what the freak? Come on here. 
You want to know? I know, safety guy, I know you giving me that. Here's the physical divisions we fly in right there. Troposphere is where we do most of the flying. There's the stratosphere. Uh, that's some of the stuff you need to know. We do most of the flying here, okay? And some of us might get up there, but not too much. And I don't really care about flying up in that area. Here's what I want to talk about. Sea level to 12.5 is what we call the physiological efficient zone. My question to you, can you have a physiological problem below 12,500? Yes. Yes, definitely. So don't let that fool you. Between 12,550, deficient zone above that space. Now we're building a space <coughs> physio... Let's see, this is recorded. I could get into it. We're going to build a physiology space course for people that want to go up and, you know, come and have a course of what's happening to them when they go up there and hit the thing and go down. I'm going to retire because I'm not sure what you can tell them. The window blows off, your eyes pop out like Schwarzenegger on Mars and you're dead. So, but we're going to build some little physiology course, G-forces and stuff like that. So, but most of you are not going up there. If you do, Armstrong lines at 63,000 feet and that's what happens to your, butter, your blood. It actually boils. So there is a line up there at 63,000 that if you don't have a spacesuit on, you're going to go, you don't care about that because you're not flying up there. Here's what we're going to talk about. By the way, you know why 12,500 is a rig for oxygen for the FA. I was in the military, and if you went above 10,000 feet, what happened to you? You put the mask on. Okay? 5,000 feet at night. Why don't we have 10,000 feet like the military does? Because you can't get through the Rockies at 10,000 feet. So they've made it 12.5, so you get an extra 30 minutes up to 14 to get through the passes in Rocky. We've legalized killing yourself. Because when I show you how much hypoxia can affect you at 12.5, yeah, it can cause you some serious problems. So you need to think about that. Just because it says efficient zone doesn't mean it's good. So here's respiration circulation, real fast for you. All we care about is a high seek to low pressure. That's the law. High seeks a low. This respiration system takes it around, circulates and takes it around. And the only reason we're talking today about this hypoxia is it gets oxygen to the body the right amount, and the right amount of CO2 is discarded from the cells. Okay, and I'm going to show you how that happens, but that's really all we care about. This right here. Okay? So we're going to be breathing about 80% nitrogen here, 20% oxygen. That's not really true. There's trace gases, but I round it up for our discussion, okay? So we're breathing about 20% oxygen here, okay? So here's how we breathe it. Comes in, atmosphere through the lungs, lungs to the blood, blood to the body cells. But now I'm not a doctor, you understand that, right? They told you I was a pilot. Everybody, some people still think I'm a doctor. There ain't no way, no way I'm a doctor, okay? So here it is. Air comes down, gets warmed up to the trach, goes down there in the cellular, gets that's where it's, the thinnest cell in the body is right there, those alveoli sacs. If you took all those alveoli sacs and spread them out, how much territory would they cover? About a half a tennis court, unless you've been doing what? If you barbecue them, they don't work good. Okay, here's a good lung, there's a bad lung. They don't, so don't ask me if hypoxia is affected by this, it is. There are some other reasons why you shouldn't smoke, okay? They're sort of subtle, but there are some reasons why. <laughs> my, my, my wife says, you can't show that movie. 
That's terrible. Uh, whoop, what happened here? Where'd we go? Back? Forward? Go forward again? Can we go forward again? Okay, here it is. Here's down there in a VLI sack. Standard day, we're breathing oxygen, nitrogen. On a standard day, it's 100. You breathe it down there, it's 40 CO2. This is on standard day if you measure those things. You just went to the gym and you came back, <laughs> you burned off this oxygen down the cells, it comes back at 40 on that hemoglobin. CO2 is loading up, getting it out of the body at 46. Remember the high? Seeks the low, reloads that hemoglobin at 100, sends it back to the body. 46 is high, 40 is low, boom, loads it, sends it back at 40, okay? Simple stuff. What happens if you go to altitude and you lower the partial pressure of oxygen? You're not going to load on as much oxygen as you need for the cells, okay? Pretty simple stuff. Circumentation system, uh, by the way, my wife teaches English as a second language and she's an English teacher. She says, how do you, how do you teach? Your words aren't quite right. The sentence structure is a little bad. I, said, ah, I teach pilots. So if I say something that's sort of a little shaky, you know, that left later, later. You know, if you eat enough crow, it tastes like chicken. Don't worry about it. So how do you increase circulation in the body? What's the best way to do it? <laughs> Every time I look at that, I get nervous. Uh, my minor is exercise physiology. I'll give you some shoe leather stuff here for the exercise folks. When you turn 50, the metabolism in the body starts kicking down, okay? Then all of a sudden, the right knee goes out. Can't play two hours of hoops. No more now. So the exercise starts going down because you don't want to go swimming. It sucks, you know, instead of having fun. So the metabolism is going down at 50. The exercise starts going down. You lose your knee. All of a sudden, your lifestyle stays the same. What happens? Seasoning, okay? And I'm telling you, at 74, it does not come off. So what we've sold the business in, we've sold 80% exercise, 20% diet. We sold that all the way up through schools. We should be selling 80% diet, 20% exercise, okay? So you need to pass that on because it's really, it's really hard to get off when you, if you're young and skinny in here, I'd go out tonight and get a whole bunch of beer and eat a steak because it's coming, you know? But most of it, I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, that's the circulatory system. There it is. It comes down there. The cells gets burned off, okay? Uh, and then it comes back, and we do it all over again. Now, we showed you how it offloads and unloads, high seeks to low, but what we really care about is this right here. We want 96 to 98 percent blood oxygen saturation in the body. And if you got that, you're, the BBs, the most sensitive parts, the rods at night vision, the second part is the brain, okay? If you got 96 to 98 percent blood oxygen saturation at sea level at 760 millimeters of mercury, you're okay. How far do you have to go up to get halfway through the atmospheric pressure? 18,000 feet. On 18,000 feet, what's your blood oxygen saturation going to be? 72 percent. You're not going to operate too well for a while. If, how long do you spend up there? If you go to 25,000 feet, you're at 9 percent. That portable oxygen tent out there, we don't change the partial pressure on it. We just take the 20% oxygen, run it through a converter, send it back in that tent, and it's at 7%. So you're setting about 26, 27,000 feet when you walk in there with no pressure change, no trapped gas issues. That's why we can put you in there. And if you get a chance, go in that thing. If you, haven't, if you don't know your hypoxia symptoms and you got a medical, go in there because it's really beneficial for you, okay? That's why we bought it up here. So. 18,000 feet, 72% is not enough, okay? 
Our distraction in the cockpit today is this. We get logged down into computers and it's hypoxia is insidious and the ego takes over and we forget what's happening and bam, we get ourselves in trouble, okay? There's a good point to this little video here. <laughs> don't, 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 don't give up your stock and paper. There's a need, okay? So anyway, when somebody gets cocked, my grandkids can do the computer better than I can do it, you know? And so it's really disgusting. They're six years old and they can pull up the TV. I can't do it up. Uh, here's hypoxia. It's insidious. It's the biggest thing that you got. Really bad for you. How many people have had hypoxia? How many people never had hypoxia? Really? You never sat long enough to get stagnant hypoxia? The blood slides down in the gluteus maximum if you go to sleep? Oh, I don't believe that. You're in the FAA. That's, <laughs> come on. <That's> what, <laughs> you're leaving on that, aren't you? I ain't talking that. Hypoxia is insidious. It goes, bottom line is you can't use the system very well and you can't think. There's a bunch of types. Positive G forces. If you sit long enough, you get pooling of the blood in the lower extremities. Blood pools out of the body. It doesn't have to be a fighter, you know. It can be if you drive the car six hours, all of a sudden you get out and your knees aren't working, the blood's pooling. You can be in a nice aircraft for five, six hours to do that. That's why you get up and walk around because it does pool. Now the fighter guys, these blue angels coming in here tomorrow, Wednesday, they got a G suit on. It gives them about protection of about two to three Gs. The, uh, probably the straining maneuver, Three second hold, one second breathe, will give them about three. G suit's usually good for about six, and so they're pretty good up to that. But if you ever get a chance to fly with them and you don't know how to do the straining maneuver, you can have some problems. Steve is flying with the Blue Angels, and he's trying to do the straining maneuver. You'll get to see him do this. The blood starts pulling in the lower extremities on positive G's. Oop, no more blood in the brain. Not going to make it. Come back, Steve. He asked him, he said, can I try it one more time? You work on the straining maneuver. Right, through on. second hole, one second breathe. Just doing a 360. Good. Here we go. Take a deep breath. Flex your legs. Here's the burners. Here we go. Not going to make it. Oh, that blood pools down the lower extremities. He has no blood up here. Brown out. Goes, takes a nap. Okay. Take the G's off. Blood comes back up. Wakes up. Wow. You're back with me. Steve is very hungry, though. All right, you're back with me. He wants a third try. I remember I told you you got to strain your muscles. Not the chewing gum. <laughs> Steve doesn't make it. Anyway. By the way, if you ever get to fly the back seat of a fighter and they're doing things, don't chew gum. It's lucky he didn't suck it down his throat and die. It's unbelievable. So anyway, that's stagnant hypoxia. Carbon monoxide is the second one that we have a problem with. You can't smell it. You can't see it. It's there. That's why you have a detector in the family. You ought to get yourself one of those to fly with if you've got a small airplane. Because if there's a manifold leak or something, you can leak, detect it. This, is a, uh, this guy right here is an Amer Air American. <laughs> He's one of our doctors, and he takes off from Kansas City. I grew up in St. Louis. I know where Paris is. He took off here to go to Kansas City. He gets to Kansas City, and they give him a letdown checklist and a radio freak. The next thing he does, he starts doing this letdown checklist, and he looks out the window, and he's sitting in a cornfield over in Mobley. Manifold leak. Took a nap, self-settling, got over to Mobley, hit this nice cornfield that was cut slid up on an knoll, you go right back to what you're doing when you come out of hypoxia, whatever it is, looks out the window, climbs out of the airplane, goes up, knocks on the door, 
airplane was hardly damaged, the prop was fixed, he sold the airplane, he got a new one, guess what he put in it? Carbon dioxide tech. So that's the second type of hypoxia, okay? Got stagnant, carbon dioxide. This will cause you to have seven kids. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> oh, is that recorded? Oh, I hope my wife never hears that. Uh, Histotoxic is alcohol, drugs, stuff like that, okay? And it's amazing how many times that we have good ideas when we've been out drinking and we have no oxygen in the BBs, you know? I got a, here I have a couple of beers, I got a great idea. Yeah. Wait till tomorrow, you know, because the BBs aren't operating, there's freaking no oxygen up there. That's the third type. And then the type we're gonna deal with is altitude hypoxia. How high do you gotta go up to get a hypoxia at altitude? It says 12.5. You, it varies with you and the self-imposed stresses. You could be at eight, 9,000 feet and get some hypoxia depending on how long you're up there and how sleep you had, if you're hydrated, all kinds of things like that. When we put people in this tent out here, we usually go in maybe three, three and a half minutes. By the time Friday comes around, if they stayed here the whole week and they're sleeping out there and they're dehydrated and they're not getting a lot of sleep, you're talking maybe two minutes. So sleep has a lot to do with it, and the self-imposed stresses has a lot to do with it. So that's something you gotta keep in mind when you're flying your airplane at what altitude. The reason we have problems with hypoxia in flight is this. They go up without supplementary oxygen. Don't think they'll need it, okay? Or don't have a backup. Sometimes they go up and they doesn't even know how to operate it, or the system hasn't been checked, and you need to check your oxygen equipment. If you're gonna take it on board, check it. Once in a while, we did every time we did in the military, checked it every day we flew if we had to. Okay. Operational factors, <clears throat> how high are you, how fast did you go up there, and how long did you stay up there? If you're set to 35,000 feet in an airliner and it blows a window and your body goes up there, you're going to have a pretty short time of effective performance time, okay? These are factors that affect it, fatigue, stress, smoke, all those self-imposed stresses. You got to guarantee age is a factor, okay? We don't like to think it is, but it is, okay? It's definitely a factor because we're not operating as well. The system's not producing the oxygen like we are. TUC or PPT is a term we use. The military term was TUC. We use more effective performance time in the GA business. I like the EPT better because this sort of says at the time I'm going to show you, you're unconscious, which is not true. You can be wide awake and not even operate in the aircraft, okay? So you can see people out there doing that. Here's the best bell curve we got. So at 25,000 feet, you have what? Three to five minutes. That's the best. How do you cut that in half? Rapid decompression, okay? So at 25,000 feet, you got a minute and a half, two and a half minutes. When you walk in that tent out there, you're gonna be at 27,000 feet. Explosive decompression. <laughs> so you're above that. You're not, you've got one and a half, two and a half minutes, depending on what's going on, okay? So these are just guidelines that you need to take a look at when you talk about hypoxia. You really want to know what your symptoms are, okay? Because that's just a guide. This guy here just took his mask off. She's going to ask if he's got air hunger. He's at 30,000 feet, I think. He says he's got some tingling in his feet. What was the last card? Four spades. Tingling in the toes right now. Look at that card again. I don't think that was a spade. He calls it a four spades. I can tell you right now, he's not at home. He's not going to operate the aircraft very well, okay? <laughs> but here's what's interesting about hypoxia. Watch this. What are you feeling right now at number 14? You got it. See? 
He got that card, didn't he? He went back, got it. Now watch what happens. Forest Bays, Forest Bays. <laughs> I just tell you, we don't need to watch the whole thing. But he never leaves Forest Bays. I can tell you right now. I don't know where he pulls up. They have to put his mask on. Yeah, he's still there talking to us, but he's not going to get it. He'll never leave four spades. So the problem is once that hypoxia hits you, unless you get down to altitude or put a mask on and get some oxygen to the system, you can be talking to people and you're not home. Okay? Not home. Signs is what you see on a pilot. It's sort of, <clears throat> it's sort of difficult to do that. I mean, you don't go fly with somebody and say, I'm going to watch signs for hypoxia today while we fly. Well, it, woo. <laughs> it's just not really don't. So you really got to know what your symptoms are. And somebody says, well, we've never been in an altitude chamber, never been in the prode out here. What's my hypoxia symptoms? And I say, if you're above 10,000 feet and something doesn't feel right, you put a mask on. If something just doesn't feel right, put your mask on. And if you're above 10, you ought to be thinking about oxygen anyway, okay? Really should be thinking about it. Okay, here's some incidences that happened. The pilot failed to maintain aircraft control as a result of hypoxia. He didn't take up oxygen with the requirement. Okay, so this one here, <clears throat> inadequate equipment the aircraft, lack of oxygen, supplement oxygen, pilot, hypoxic physiological impairment. Killed four of them. This is the big one over in Greece, if you remember this in 05, where they followed them around for a while and they were all passed out and they ran into a mountain and killed all of them. The latest one I can show you, there's a bunch. Larry Grazer took off from New York going to Naples. 26,000 feet or so, he said he had an emergency, and the next thing they know, they followed him all the way out to Jamaica, and the wife and his, they were really nice people, passed out on the controls, got past Jamaica, and went in, never came back. So the thing is, you get above 10,000, especially in a small aircraft, if you lose some kind of stuff like that, you got some problems. These folks flying at uh, above 40,000 feet, 38, 40,000 feet up there, the the uh, Lockheed study had a pilot sitting at a desk. He's going to do explosive decompression. The mask is right here. It's a quick dawn, which means you get it, slide it on in less than five seconds. That's the requirement. They're going to tell him when they blow the chamber, <coughs> the tech's ready, pilot's ready, go. They blow the chamber, the pilot gets right here with the mask, and that's it. He doesn't go any further. If the tech didn't put it on him, he wouldn't have made it. That's at 41,000 feet. That's how fast it goes. So when we got people flying around above 40,000 feet, somebody better have a mask on because it just doesn't take much time with a rapid decompression. But where's the biggest problem for us with hypoxia for general aviation? Below 20,000 feet and down. So if you look at the NTSB website and you say, well, they had a control flight and terrain in the mountains, why? We don't know if it's hypoxic, but why did they run into the mountain? Did they not see it? Was it spatial deer? Was it it's hard to determine that after everything's gone, okay? Prevention, know your oxygen equipment, how to use it. Prevent, know your symptoms. Get in the pro out here. We run it every half hour. We open up at 8.30. We start at 9. Every hour on the half hour till 4.30. We're here till Sunday, okay? Get yourself a ride in there and get you to know what your symptoms are so you can recognize them and, and protect yourself, okay? Oxygen pacimeter, we got that out there for you to look at. 95% blood oxygen saturation. There's your heart rate and there's the blood oxygen saturation. You can stick that thing on there. We do it out here to show you where it's at. If that <coughs> oxygen pacimeter reading in that probe gets down to below 65, even if you don't have three symptoms like we asked, we tell them to put the mask on because the difference between La La Land and Waken Land is not very much, especially when you go real fast into 27,000 feet. That's Mount Everest, okay? So yes, sir. Yep, that's a fair number. The break, for what I've heard and what, of course, now that's up to you. And that you're, you, any 90%, you ought, to, you ought to put some on. 90, 92. Say again? This question was, if I'm flying around at my altitude and I have an oxygen pacimeter reading on, I use 92 as my decision making whether I need oxygen. And I, and I would say that, that's fair. Okay? That's what the question is. I've heard 92%, I've heard 90, okay? Actually, I use the higher number to go on. Yeah. If I get below 92, I'm cranking up. Yeah. 
It depends on where you're at, how long you've been flying, and where you're going, and how long you're going to be airborne. A lot of that stuff. Because really what you're doing is protecting yourself. Okay? Uh, did you get that on tape? I talked loud enough. You're going to stay. This is for him? Okay. Oh, you want another question? Okay, here. I'll have to cut down my jokes. So I use 92 for me, but yeah. I have passengers. And frankly, I don't care if the passengers are up at 92. I don't want them falling asleep. But what's a safe level for them? What safe number I should be using? <laughs> how many kids people do you that have I like? How long do you want them to stay awake? <laughs> people that I like. Yeah, I, boy, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to answer that. I'm retiring in December, man. I answered that wrong, and somebody go, "Oh my gosh!" Well, in the chamber, in the, in our altitude chamber, we tell people to get three symptoms, and if they're when they go in there, they're going to go down to about 72%, 70% right away, okay? When they start going down into the upper 60s, most of them have two or three symptoms, but they're not listening. And we tell them, you got three symptoms, what's your plus rate? 68. Well, hello, put your mask on. Because it, it, you're not going to die, but it, we don't want them passing out here. We're friendly FAA, you know, we love you. We're here to help. So. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's sort of. I don't know what you do with that. You know, what you got a suggestion? No. I, yeah, I the, don't. The, the question is would better be phrased. You know, I want to keep mine up because I'm flying the plane, all that yeah. stuff. But the other is just for health. General it's, health. 80, 72. General health is 85? 96 percent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's all I'm gonna. Better health. The be, you're better off with the be, more oxygen you got. Uh, but it, it just. Yeah, I. Yeah. But when do they start worrying? Both low ninety-six percent. I, I think the I think the question there comes down to: Do you really have to ration the oxygen? Yes. How much well, oxygen? no, I, and I understand that, and it, it gets to that. If yes. I do have to ration it, I'm yeah. the pilot's getting it clearly. But at what point do I have to start thinking? Well, how long are you going to stay up there? Well, I, I think that's a factor. Yeah. That stagnant hypoxia. How long you stay up there? So if you're going to be up there for another two hours. And you're dropping them down into 80, 85 percent blood oxygen saturation. I don't know if I'd do that. Now, one of the guys. I think I'd stay above 90 percent for everybody. It depends. Now, if you're talking 15, 20 minutes, and you're landing somewhere, but I think over a couple hours of period, you need to pull that up. Now, I tell you a better question. I'm going to ask the docs when I get out. The docs are right next door. We belong to them. I'm going to ask that question because I don't really have a good answer to that. It's the first time someone's asked me. I have wanted to use it with my seven kids, you know, in the back of a van, but it wouldn't work there. Drugs work. No, I didn't say that. Now, here's where the question comes from. I have a friend that I fly with regularly, and when we go up to altitude, and we're just 12, 14,000 feet, yeah. he's down to 88, and I don't care what I set it for. He's at 88, yeah. and it goes down from there. Yeah. Well, physiologically, once again, we're all different. We've seen people... We've, had a person walk in the chamber in there, and they were 70 percent just from anxiety. So it, once again, it's a toss-up physiologically. You got to sort of know who you are. But I will get an answer for that. That's a good question. I never had that answered. So here's a here's a ballpark. Give me your name because I don't want any credit for this. My name is. No, I sneeze and you just what you. physician in a hospital okay. and I'm an anesthesiologist there you go and in recovery room 90% is the cutoff there you go we don't let anybody get below 90% or we intervene that's right so I, that doesn't necessarily answer your question but that's a ballpark they're figure they don't go below well I, I can't answer your question specifically I'm just telling you that that is our intervention if you look at the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve yep it drops off radically Rapid. below 90. It, yes, above 90. You go to 90 like this. I don't have the curve, but if you go like that, then all of a sudden at 90, it goes like this. Yeah. Will it harm the, pay, the, the person? I can't answer that. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a comment. I've been through the pressure chamber at the Air Force uh, numerous times years ago. And when I became hypoxic, I had totally total memory loss during that period of time I was hypoxic. 
Never got that memory back. Yeah. See, there's different, when we say what's your symptom, what happens to you, whew, it's varied because we're all different. And that's the key. We're giving you a general, here's a safe area to operate. And that's all I can do. I tell you, if you got a problem, though, 100%, check your regulator, slow your breathing rate down, get below 10,000 feet. That checklist takes care of two things, hypoxia and what else? What's number three do for you? <laughs> Hyperventilation. You're offloading the CO2 too fast, shuts off the blood flow, you take a nap. Symptoms very similar to hypoxia. We tell people when they come out of the chamber and you put the mask on to slow your breathing rate down. Because they'll go like that and go right into hypoxia. So that's something you got to look at. Somebody said, well, I got hypoxia. Well, no, they were just got some problems with hyperventilation, which is a result of lack or less O2 getting dumped off the system too fast. Who, what causes it? Anxiety, excitement, stress, fear breathing. Pressure breathing doesn't really bother your breathing cycles. Active, passive. So if you got pressure pushing against it on 39,000 feet when the first pressure comes on the mask, you got to push against that, and if you breathe too fast, you'll go into that. You probably won't run into that unless you're in a high aircraft. But the other stuff will cause you to do that. Stress, things like that you need to take a look at. Okay, that's hyperventilation. There are similarities to that, but most of the time, the symptoms are very similar to hypoxia, and you got to take a look at the environment that you're in, okay, and what's going on in, your, what's going on in the cockpit. Same recovery system, okay? Uh, we had a guy in the chamber, FAA guy, rapid decompression, 8 to 18,000 feet, puts their mask on. He's sitting over there. This side's going off mask. This side's watching. O'Ken drops his clipboard. Look down there pretty soon. He's trying to get his mask on. And we walked over. When he pulled the mask, clicked on off there. He pulled the little rubber kit off the thing. He didn't check the flow meter. He'd been breathing regular air for the whole time. If we hadn't put that together, he wouldn't have made it. See, so you got to check those connections. Make sure you're getting some air in there, okay? Uh, we recommend 10,000 feet a day, 5,000 feet a night, especially for the rods. Really, really good, okay? Uh, any questions on hypoxia? It's pretty fast. It's sort of, you get above 10, you got to figure out what you're doing and how long you're doing it and things like that. Don't forget the alcohol, stagnant hypoxia, and carbon dioxide is still the type of hypoxia that messes together. Trap gas, there's two areas four areas, two usually going up, two going down. What are the two going up that cause problems with trap gas? Gut, teeth, two coming down, frontals, maxillary sinuses, middle ear, okay? Not a guarantee that it's that, but generally those are the sequences that they do, okay? Lungs are a factor if you're gonna have a rapid decompression, you're gonna hold your breath, you're gonna die. We don't talk about that, that's natural selection. <laughs> you're not gonna hold your breath. We're going to have a rapid dig, hold your breath. No, that's not going to happen. So, he, uh, sometimes you get a little pain in here if you're going flying. If you get a little pain in here, it could be there's some uh, small uh, sinuses in here. There's the frontals and the maxillaries. There's some small sinuses right here that can feel like teeth. I'm going to switch out. You're going to switch me out? Quit, quit, off your switch. You can't talk to me? We can't. You don't want to hear me? Is that all right? Okay, you want this? I gotta carry this around. Unfortunately. My gosh, how much pay do I get for this? Let's see, I can't get that up. There you go. Does that work? There you go. I don't you could hear me in the back, couldn't you? I don't want to do this over again. I got a chicken coop in Norman, Oklahoma. I got in that chicken coop 30, 25 chickens in a chicken run for 18 six it's eight by sixteen, the chicken coops is eight by twenty. In the chicken coop I had to put the two doors, you know why? You put four doors into chicken sedan. Ah, how's that one? You get that? Chicken sedan, two doors, four doors, okay. Uh, going up, I can't believe I got talking this much. Is that working? All right. Gut, cool resource management. Don't eat certain kind of foods. Okay, when you go up, it hurts you. My, my wife's got a cast iron skillet from Missouri. She bakes beans and stuff, whole brown sugar. Bakes this stuff for about three hours. When I turn 50, I can't eat that. I turn into a gas machine. Bino, the doctors, I'm grounded, man. I go out to the dogs in the lab, you know. She forgot this year and gave it to me on Labor Day. She paid the price. So what I'm saying is when you go fly, watch what you're eating because you don't want to get up there and cause a problem, okay? It's, yeah, this is shoe leather stuff here, man, <laughs> okay? All right, here we go with the uh, 
middle ear. There it is. There's the tympanic membrane, middle ear, and station tube. There's the frontals, maxillaries. There's some small ones in here. When you're going up to altitude, the high pressure is inside. The old pressure is going to be in the outside. High is going to seek the low, and it's going to come out and equalize that in there in the middle ear. Okay, that's generally. Now, if you fly with a cold and you got snot and mucus and you come down, where's the high pressure going to be? It's going to be on the outside. Low pressure is here. So if you can't valve salvo and put air through there and equalize that temperature, the, the, the pressure, the high is going to seek a low and put a hole in there. That's where you get an eardrum problem. Okay? Now, if you could clear the ears, I can hear both of them pop. You will probably take care of the frontals and maxillary sinuses. But that's not a guarantee, so it depends on who you are and the, you know, your physiology because some people are allergic to certain times of the year and you, get a, you clear your ears, but the sinuses don't clear. Anybody had a sinus block? It's ugly, man. It's like a knife in the head. It's, I had one at 38. That's bad. So don't fly if you, you had a cold or if you don't think you can clear, okay? Uh, Henry's Law, how much nitrogen are you breathing? 80%. It's in solution. If it comes out of solution in the bubbles, what happens? Decompression sickness. You get the bends. Is that the only type? No, the bends are the common ones, okay? It's in the joint, the bubbles check here, the bubble, you get that, okay? That's pretty bad, but that's not uncommon. Skin bends, splotches right here, okay? Okay, pretty dangerous stuff. Neurological is the brain, spinal cord, things like that. Pretty bad use, and the chokes are in the lungs, okay? Now, in the United States Air Force, if you were a U-2 or SR-71 SR pilot in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you came down with the bends, what happened? That was probably the end of the stars. You went to a 141 or something. So in the, 90, in the 90s, they decided, and they figured it out, you can have the bend once and never get it again. It's not like something contagious. So they went back to all the Air Force honest pilots and asked the U-2 SR-71 pilots how many people have had the bends in their career. About 98% said they did. So they didn't tell anybody. So it's not on, it's uncommon. Now, in the Air Force, if you had a rapid decompression, you got to 25,000 feet. If you could be safe, you got to 18,000 feet, went on 100% oxygen, okay? And that usually takes care of it. That's why we don't have problems with the bends in the altitude chamber in Oklahoma City because we only go to 25,000. We used to go to 35, and they figured that's dangerous. So we only go to 25 now, okay? Now, <laughs> 18,000 feet safe unless you've been doing what? Scu scuba diving. If you go scuba diving, one atmospheric pressure is 32, 33%, something like that, salt water, fresh water. So if you're going to go scuba diving, then you're going to go fly. You need to get the books out and check the thing, especially if you go to Colorado and you dive one of those lakes up in the mountains. Then you go down in there and come up. That's when you've got to watch the DCS problems, okay, especially if you're scuba diving. Most of you don't have that problem, okay? Operational as far as DCS, how fast you go up, what altitude are you at, and how long you stay at altitude. Repetitive exposures for us guys that go in the chamber. This is mostly what you deal with. You probably won't deal with that, okay? Uh, we recommend 24 hours if you scuba dive below 30, okay? That's sort of recommendation and operation. Just keep yourself safe, okay? Treatment of D D DCS, 100% oxygen, immobilize the area, dig it down as soon as practical, find you what? Find you a doctor that understands aviation medicine, okay? Okay, and then if you have to, they put you in the dive chamber, put you up on a table six and bring you back up the bubbles, sluice back and then bring you up on a table six and you're back to normal. Not too many problems. Anybody had DCS here? Yeah, well, you're a Air, the Air Force guy. <laughs> Here's my replacement. <laughs> they, they didn't laugh at my jokes that loud. I think it's because they're a little stagnant hypoxia. <laughs> they don't, all they care is the air condition. Uh, signs of decompression, sickness, noise, temperature, fog, wind blast, stuff like that. We talked about those four subjects at the top. We're not talking about that other one. But what I want to show you is self-imposed stress. Alcohol, drugs, tobacco, and fatigue have a factor in that. If you took the NASA kind of measures fatigue course, how much sleep are you supposed to get a night? Eight plus or minus two. Depends on who you are and 
what if you're over 50, you're sleeping more, getting less, okay? Uh, if you're over 50, you sleep more, and you're a man, why, why are you having a problem? Because you've got to get up and go to the bathroom twice a night or something. So you're not getting disrupted sleep is really a mess. It must, you're not sleeping eight hours if you have to do that, okay? So you've got to take that stuff into effect. And fatigue is a big factor with it. The bedroom is supposed to be used. You walk into your bedroom, it's supposed to be dark, cool, no TV, no radio, no reading in bed. Nothing. You're supposed to just go to sleep. Guess who has a problem with sleeping in my house? The blonde. You know, and she reads in bed. She does the crossword puzzles. She does that. She wakes up at 3 in the morning looking. At, and I said, Susan, all the PhDs like Bruce are saying, hey, this is what you need to stop. I don't think that has anything to do with it. You can either be right or you can be happy. So I build a big pillow wall on the king-size bed and I get in that, and then I go to sleep. So it's working out good. But I had a guy say, well, I read in bed. I sleep good. Well, that's fine. If you're sleeping good, you don't feel fatigued, go for it, okay? Uh, under high periods of stress, you don't rise to occasion, but level of proficiency. So you've got to know what stress is. Get you some dogs. Those are my buddies. I lost two. Where is that guy? I lost two of them. Or you talk about they can sleep anywhere. I mean, you take a nap, you can kick them out, they go over here and stuff like that. This is what we offer down in Oklahoma City. We got a general aviation one day course and a one day survival course. How do you sign up? It's on that little DVD out there. You can go fa.gov, Airman Education Programs. You call us up 90 days and we'll set up a schedule. You come down there, we'll give you some free stuff. Okay? Pretty good deal if you get a chance to get a group of people together. This is what's on that DVD right there. Those are the subjects. They got review sections, so you can go back and look at hypoxia, DCS, trap gas, and see if I lied to you. Okay, it's got re it's got a pamphlets on it, so you can use it for a safety meeting and stuff like that. And it's got a whole bunch of stuff on it. It's got the survival stuff on there. It's pretty good stuff. Okay, some of the human factor stuff from my CRM course that I help teach over there is on there. About five of those. That's it. Uh, we don't need to run that. That's my email if you want me. Don't call me. I'm, I'm retired. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I tell you. Um, any questions? That was really fast. Uh, the key is just be safe. If you're going to go above 10,000 feet, check your six because uh, it's sort of dangerous. Uh, I went skiing up 10,000 feet at Breckenridge. Too. You got a question back here? They you want a question. Yes, I can. Any other questions? Okay. Um, <laughs> if you cross a hyena with a martial arts instructor, what do you get? Chuckle Norris. Huh? Now I'm going to tell you what's sad about this. You ready? This is true. Oklahoma City's got a new hotel downtown in Oak City. It's a Hilton. They hooked it up to the, the Marriott. This happened on Cox News this morning. That's why I'm happy to be up here in Oklahoma City. And they were building this open concept in the bathrooms, indoor, everything was all open, check-in, everything. Somebody in the middle of the night in that new hotel, it's not complete, came in and stole every bit of the toilets out of those public restrooms and took them out of the building. They don't have them anymore. You know what the problem they had with it? Please have none to go on. There you go. That's all I can give you. Thanks a lot, guys. I'll run that for you. <laughs> Let me get it back for you. Okay.